This is Chuck Sachs for Indie Opera Podcast, and I'll be chatting with composer Garrett Fisher and librettist Ellen McLaughlin about their new opera, Blood Moon, which is receiving its world premiere production as part of Prototype Festival 2020 at the Baruch Performing Arts Center on January 9th, 11th, 12th, and 15th through 17th. Hello, how are you both? Well, Pretty good. And I did get that right, Jen McLaughlin. Yeah, although we, I also answer to McLaughlin because we've been <laughs> mispronouncing it for a long time. Well, I have Scottish in my blood, and so it's like I'm, I'm, I'm used to doing that now. <laughs> so this is cool. Um, how did you both first meet? Because you're West Coast and you're basically East Coast. Um, Were you put together? Well, so a couple of years ago, Beth Morrison, who's producing the show, mm-hmm. um, wanted to commission something from me. Okay. <laughs> and I knew Rachel Dickstein, the director. Um, and so I had fallen in love with this play that's loosely based, or that's uh, based on a Japanese no play called mm-hmm. Obasute, which is about um, a story of a woman who had been abandoned on the mountain by her relatives and her spirits just kind of lingering on the mountain. And I found it really compelling so I kind of wanted to do something based on that. And I talked to Rachel, and she mentioned Ellen's name, um, because Ellen is, has done a lot of work um, as a playwright, um, sort of adapting Greek drama to contemporary language and culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she has a, a deep understanding of formalism, I would say, mm-hmm. um, as Japanese no theater is also very formalistic, and I thought that'd be a really cool match. Right. So I reached out to her and we talked, and it just seemed like a really good fit. Excellent. So first Beth and then Rachel Dixie made the next shit up. Right, exactly. And But also, I mean, it, it fits into your wheel box because I know a lot of your works are based on, on Greek myths mm-hmm. and, and some on no drama and some on even uh, historical characters. Right. The, the Passion of St. Sebastian, The Passion of Thomas More. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've always... I just seem to be really drawn to theater that's very ritualistic and formalistic. Mm-hmm. And so um, in college, I studied Shakespeare. Um, and then my uh, professor, who was a mentor to me, sort of talked about Chinese opera and no theater and turned me on to all of that. And so then I started getting into those. And I just really loved their structures because they're very simple on like one level. Mm-hmm. But they're the sim- that simplicity really allows for a lot of openness. Um, and I feel like that works really well with kind of how I write music. And Ellen, I mean, originally you started off as an actor. When was the first the shift you made to playwright? I'm not shifted away from acting. I'm still I, acting. I, actually, yes, I do know that. So I'm and actually thank you. Starting, Good. <laughs> just starting a rehearsal process the day after Christmas, actually, for a world premiere down at George Street Playhouse um, in New Brunswick. So, yeah, I, I try to keep both careers going and some some years it's more one than the other but Mm -hmm. i'm really um i'm only happy when i can keep both uh going at the same time uh so yeah i've been uh i've been writing as long as i've been acting and i i like to think that the acting makes me a better writer and the writing makes me a better actor but i'm not sure yeah (laughs) i hope that that's the case because i i just think that if you're aware as an actor of uh, the um, the nature of the way the way that your part the way that your character fits into the dramaturgy, mm-hmm. it makes you more effective um, in within the play. And I think that as a an actor, I I have great respect for actors and a great love of them and uh, so, uh, an appreciation for what they can do and what I don't need to do as a writer. Mm-hmm. So I I try not to get all over. Of now, uh, have any of the works been that you started originally were works to give you other work to showcase your I own never, acting? Or I, I never wanted to write for myself, but mm-hmm. I, I ended up writing one piece called Penelope, which is um, a rethinking of the Odyssey from the female point of view. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's actually a song cycle with um, music composed by Sarah Kirkland Snyder, and uh, it's been done a lot. And, and that's that was your first salvo into music theater, in a sense, right? As I yeah, mean, in I writing. I now can't really remember. I've I've been sort of in the 
theater, music theater mm-hmm. scene a bit. Um, you're married to Rindy Eckert, who's very much part of the music theater yes. <laughs> and the opera world. And so uh, we worked, sort of straddled both media for a long time. Um, right, but I mean, really, it's, I know uh, the Trojan Women, which yeah. was you first to play, and now you, you adapted that into an opera mm-hmm. with, um, I'm sorry. Sarah Ellis. Yes, Sarah Ellis. And for those who know, we featured that in our June 2019 episode. And now, so this is really the third kind of libretto you're working on. Yeah, I guess that is the case. Have you found it a little easier? Although Trojan Woman was based on your own play adaptation. This is... Well, the Trojan Women, really, I didn't do any adaptation mm-hmm. of. It really already, it was basically set mm-hmm. as, a, as an opera. Now, this is, um, this is quite different in that um, the, the Penelope is a sort of monologue with a song cycle mm-hmm. attached. And this was something where uh, Garrett and I talked through what we thought we might, might like to do with this, um, is using this ancient play as a springboard. And then we really, I uh, took huge liberties, and Garrett was uh, encouraged that, and we turned it into a three-character piece. And it's quite uh, different from anything that anybody would understand as a no-inspired piece, but it is, that was the springboard. And what we did was I basically went off and wrote the libretto before Garrett had written a note, which is not his usual way of working. <laughs> And then uh, handed the libretto over, and uh, Garrett basically took it and ran. Mm-hmm. And the the kind of rewriting that I've done on it has been pretty minimal, as you know, thinking of it as a playwright. Mm-hmm. Playwrights do an awful lot more uh, rewriting, certainly during um, the ramp up to a production. But then within a production, there's just much more leeway because. You're not dealing with so many working parts. Right. right? Opera is the hardest one to actually be rewriting when mm-hmm. you're in yeah. rehearsal and production. You can't do that to people. <laughs> no, no, no. I, it's it's uh, hard enough to just present them with stuff in rehearsal. I've workshop enough musicals and they want to scream at you. Yeah, but it's really, I mean, when mm. the writing is as complex and rich as mm-hmm. what Garrett's doing mm-hmm. and what the singers are capable of, how, how they're mm-hmm. able to meet that, you can't mess around with it too much. Yeah. Well, we've done little like word mm-hmm. changes and stuff like that, but in terms of like major rethinking, there's mm-hmm. just no, no ability to do that. And But I, I do know that <clears throat> with the Fisher Ensemble, there is there are definite elements of improvisation uh-huh. through rehearsal, and is it does it even go into performance, or does it get yeah. set? Well, so usually, I mean, this has been a really new experience for me. And the Fisher Ensemble is the ensemble that Garrett heads as artistic director in Seattle. Right. And they're not actually part of this production. Yes. But um, this is one of the first projects I've really worked without the Fisher Ensemble. And usually I do have a highly collaborative sort of process oriented rehearsal process where I really know the performers I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And they kind of have my shorthand down. (laughs) So sometimes I can just kind of sort of point them in directions and they understand. And then through kind of this process, we develop the piece. And also in that process, I often have worked with writers in a whole different sort of relationship where I kind of tell them, write a whole bunch of stuff based on like the story or this topic. And then what I'm going to do is take that and kind of pick and choose and then put it into the piece. Mm-hmm. And that that's just um, what we, what we had here is that Beth, you know, commissioned Ellen to write this libretto. And we talked a lot through, like, what are the elements that are really compelling? What are the, you know, how do we take it from this piece? And then, as you said, make it a springboard, as opposed to, like, we're not doing a no play. Mm -hmm. Um, We wanted to do something in English that felt very contemporary, um, but that also hearkened to Ellen's sort of sense of Greek tragedy. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, you want the sense of the ancient. mm -hmm. You want Mm -hmm. the sense of these huge elemental forces Mm -hmm. that... That it, you know, you don't want to contem- make it contemporary and flatten it. Right. Mm-hmm. There's something so um, grand and you know enormous about what the the no plays imply, mm-hmm. and you don't want to size it down. Right. 
Because what would be the point of that? I mean, the reason that one's drawn to these mm -hmm. things, I mean, I've done a lot of Greek stuff, but the reason we're drawn to those those great works and we're drawn to the note plays is partly because of their age and mm -hmm. because of the size of what they take on. And um, turning them into contemporary operas never makes any sense. To right, me. right. It, it's, it doesn't quite work when something has this ritualistic element, this, this myth element, but it also, especially no, there is a complete flavor of the society it was written mm -hmm. for and within that doesn't completely... I mean, translate to bringing forward so easily. Right. Yeah. And I think the libretto, um, you, Ellen's really managed to capture that balance between it feeling very contemporary, but also mm -hmm. kind of timeless and sort of non-specific archetypal. Yeah, that's definitely what we're going for. And I mm -hmm. think that's true for the music. It's It's sort of, it has Western elements. It has Eastern elements. It's not sitting down... Uh, mm -hmm. smack inside any time period or any real um, nationality, mm -hmm. it's, uh, which is what I think one wants to do with these plays. If you're going to not, I mean, it's always possible to just do a translation mm -hmm. into English of a Greek play or a no play, but what would be the fun of that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it doesn't really, it, it would be, I think, for me, it would feel dishonest mm -hmm. because I, you know, am this white American lady. <clears throat> I, I did feel, I mean, reading the libretto, that was there was a little more drama than I generally ex expect from a no play. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, moving a little faster, um, have, having seen a number of no plays and and Buto works also, mm -hmm. it's like going at their points in my Americans. It's like, can we move an inch faster? Right. Yeah. And so it was it was very relatable and mm -hmm. I mean even the moon as this semi anthropomorphic I mean you're not really anthropomorphizing the moon it just it is uh, well, I like to think of the moon as the presiding deity uh -huh. who speaks to us but mm -hmm. the characters can't hear the moon but we can hear the moon mm -hmm. um and the moon considers this the moon's play Mm -hmm. And it is. <laughs> <laughs> the moon's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. It's like, it is called Blood Moon. Right. Yeah. It's about me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you got your, um, you started writing when you, when you finally got to Oberlin, was it? Or Yeah, I've always loved, well, I've always loved music and I play piano mm -hmm. um, since I can remember. So I'm a classically trained pianist also. So I went to Oberlin for piano and composition. Um, I dropped out of the piano just because I realized I love playing piano, but I'm just, that's not me. And I really, you know, composition, I like to be on that end of things. I, I hear you. It's like, mm -hmm. I kept saying them, it's like, yes, I'm a good pianist, but I don't want to go into a practice room and come out with something I practice that's someone else's music. I want to come out with exactly. something that is mine. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've always been excited by, by writing music. And I think it was at Oberlin actually sort of combining composition with some English and theater courses that I mm -hmm. really began to see my music as part of a theatrical world and that the way I write music is more narrative than just pure like instrumental stuff. That's sort of my natural mm -hmm. angle. Um, so after I graduated, I um, started working with people informally and um, a couple years later I came up with the Passion of St. Thomas More sort of out of the blue. Um, just I liked this concept of not signing a statement as a very basic plot point, mm -hmm. um, which kind of harkened back to this sense of formalism. And then I started, I found myself kind of becoming collaborative without realizing what I was doing. So I kind of stumbled into the whole idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that I really love working that way. It's I love working with people that you can trust and you, I learn so much and I keep growing and it allows me to become myself a little bit more. Um, and so you, that's kind of how it started. And your production has, become, production has become very well known for the whole multimedia mm -hmm. uh, aspect. Yeah. I try to create, um, or it seems that what happens is that the way I write music, there's sort of a sense of openness to it, which invites the other elements to, to become equal partners. Mm -hmm. We're often in productions like this, you have like a hierarchy, you know, here's the music and then everything kind of is layered onto it, mm -hmm. which is, those are awesome as well. But the way that I work, it seems that there's a lot more dialogue 
um, part of the challenge of that is that as you work the piece, um, you have to figure out as a network of mm-hmm. stuff. So you have to find the balance and you have to figure out what part of the storytelling storytelling mm-hmm. happens like with the staging or what happens with the video projection mm-hmm. or what happens with uh, the music or the words. And so they all kind of, in the best of all possible worlds, they all come together. It, it's, I mean, really the path mm-hmm. that I feel that American opera has taken is, is closer to the path of music theater mm-hmm. and especially contemporary music theater that... It is not as we would think, you know, uh, prima la musica Mm -hmm. and the words come after. It really is these collaborations and not just between the writers, but then in everything else that's happening where we're used to, you know, knowing Wagner just, you know, did what he did and sort of had some collaborators or whatever, Mm -hmm. Strauss, but it really was them. Yeah. And it's it's not that way. And I, I... feel it's it's given a, a new breath, a new energy, mm-hmm. and also an elasticity. Yeah. Right? Would you agree? Yeah. And I think that it, it's demanded different kinds of performers. And mm-hmm. um, th- there have to be uh, <clears throat> singers who can also act. Yeah. And who can actually handle text. And who actually want to have their words understood. Mm-hmm. Just different, you know, than, than the old school which was really not about lyric um and on that note the people that i work with not only have to be good actors and understand text and they also have to be able to improvise Mm -hmm. and much the way an actor has to be able to improvise on some level where you Mm -hmm. give an actor a direction like Mm -hmm. you know it's different every night yeah Mm -hmm. and so i incorporate that also so those are you know i feel actually that performers in this production are really grabbing onto that and going mm-hmm. with it. So um, I've been very excited about that. We I, also are working with uh, Rachel Dickstein, who mm-hmm. I've worked with several times now as an actor and as also as a, mm-hmm. a writer. And her, um, she has a great feel for design mm-hmm. and also a great feel for dance. And uh, there's uh, she has a truly... Uh, uh, unique nose for beauty i mean she's she's really drawn towards visually striking images and i think that the kinds of directors who are directing opera are not just throwing a whole lot of money at a set or at costumes Mm -hmm. but now there is this kind of uh as a director you have to direct the way that um stage directors direct Mm -hmm. plays and also you have to have a sense of um, movement and it's 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 more demanding of all of mm. us in very good ways I think uh, yeah I've seen that with the work of James Dara mm-hmm. um, who is heads of uh, the One Festival at uh, Opera Omaha and uh, Louise Prosk and Ethan Herod at uh, Heartbeat I mean it is just a whole new generation Kevin Newberry and it's exciting mm-hmm. um, to see this growth and th- this energy. Um, coming through. Yeah, and I mean, Ethan comes straight out. I know Ethan from the theater world. Yes. He was a theater uh, director for to begin with and, and then moved toward, into musicals and then into opera. And I think that that basis, instead of sort of sending people directly into directing opera because mm-hmm. that's what <laughs> they're going to do for the rest mm-hmm. of you know, the the mobility of these directors through different media is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And it helps us all. <clears throat> so is the production going to be very multimedia as you're used to, Garrett? Or Yeah, so as I said, you know, this one new thing from this production is that I was, you know, here's the libretto. Right. And so I really just felt like I started, I wrote it from beginning to end. Um, and I just decided I'm just going to trust it 100%. And I'm going to have a couple larger arc concepts in my mind as I do it, but I'm just going to follow my intuition mm-hmm. and just trust Mm-hmm. And I found it really easy. Um, I wrote it pretty quickly, just the way Ellen wrote the libretto. Um, you know, as Ellen said, she didn't make a lot of changes to the words. I haven't made a lot of changes to the music. Um, I found that as I started writing, and there was sort of a natural sonic language that kicked in, especially like with the instrumentation. So like the flute is sort of equated loosely with the ghost of the aunt character. And then 
the Viola da Gamba is associated with the nephew character who's mm-hmm. the living mortal mm-hmm. um, who's come to the mountain. And then the moon is like bamboo flute and there's Indian harmonium, which I've used a lot. And I mm-hmm. kind of felt like all these elements just sort of naturally started falling into place as I just dove in, like I was downhill skiing and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to keep going mm-hmm. and not think about it. And I felt like that's new. Um, but I found it really weirdly much in line with what I've done. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of been a different sort of entry point. And will you both be here through the whole rehearsal process? I am. Uh, well, we, we've been part of it for the three weeks that we've had. Mm-hmm. Um, when they come back, I'm, I'm going to have to... Because you're be, off to George I'm Street. Off, mm-hmm. I'm off to rehearsal, but I'll be back for opening night. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, again, it's going to be... Amazing. Yeah, I so that we've been rehearsing all of December, so I've been mm-hmm. here for that. Um, and then I'll be back the tech week, you know, before opening and I'll be here through the run. Mm -hmm. And it's a good theater for it. I I love the Nagelberg. Mm -hmm. It just, it shift can shift so many different ways. I think it, you know, I think that the set that's been created is going to, is very archetypal, but also intimate. And so I think that it will, I think, um, Rachel's done a good job of kind of creating this immersive world Mm -hmm. that it's kind of what I think the music does too that we're just going to kind of get drawn into the world of the moon. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see it after talking to both of you and reading libretto. And thank you for sitting and talking with me. Um, here's wishing everyone a joyful holiday season. And thank you all for listening to Indie Opera Podcast. Cheers. Cheers.